And so without further ado, I have the distinct honor of introducing the author. And uh, I'd like to ask that you silence your devices and uh, we will move on with the program. Sir Salman Rushdie is a world-renowned novelist and essayist. He's the author of more than 11 novels and has earned numerous distinctions, including being selected to serve as a fellow of the British Royal Society of Literature. He was also selected as a distinguished writer in residence at the Carter Journalism Institute at the New York University. His second novel, Midnight Child, won a Booker Prize, and that was deemed the best novel among all winners, marking the 25th and 40th anniversaries of the prize. There are so many other accolades that I could mention, but time is short, and I know you want to hear from Salman Rushdie. But he was also, as you may know, knighted by Queen Elizabeth II for his many, many contributions to literature. He is no stranger to Miami Book Fair, having made appearances here uh, many times, and today he will talk to us about one of his newest novels, The Golden House. Please let's give a warm Miami Book Fair welcome to Salman Jirushdi. So, uh, thank you all for coming. It's great, always great to be here at the book fair. Um, I can't remember how many times it is, but it's been a few. And you're still showing up, so, <laughs> so that's kind of a good sign. Um, I've been, you know, I was listening to George Saunders before, and he was talking about how he's been traveling with his book for a very long time. Uh, you know, I felt his pain. <laughs> um, and, you know, by the time you get round to this point, sort of towards the end of a book tour, you begin to wonder what it is that you really want to say. And I, I thought that what I wanted to say today to all of you is that I've been, my work, I think, has been working its way towards America for a very long time. Um, back in the late 90s, I wrote a novel called The Ground Beneath Her Feet, which was partly set in India, partly in England, and the second half was set here, but that was a very different America. That was, it was really about the New York City that I first learned about when I came as a kid. When I was like 24, 25 years old, I came to New York in the, in the early 70s. Uh, you know, that other New York, which was dirty and broke and and dangerous in parts, and cheap. Uh, uh, and as a result of being cheap, was full of young creative people. Um, and so I found myself, you know, on my first trip to the city, in this downtown area, surrounded by young filmmakers and musicians and writers and painters and so on. And I thought, how cool is this? You know, that, that New York of which the North Pole was Max's Kansas City and the South Pole was CBGB's. <laughs> and, 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 uh, which, as anyone who knows the city knows, are not very far apart. <laughs> um, anyway, so that novel was about that. I mean, it's a novel about rock and roll music, and so it's, it's set in that, in that place and in that time. And then gradually I've been working my way closer to the present moment. Um, my novel Fury was written I mean, my novel Fury had the bizarre fate of being published on September 11, 2001. Uh, not a great day to publish a novel, um, for all kinds of reasons, most of which are not literary. But it was a novel about the summer of 2000 in New York, really, which was the first year I'd spent there since I moved there to live. And the strange thing was that I'd written it as this kind of almost like a sort of comic, satirical novel about that, on the first page, the narrator says about the city that, that it boiled with money. And that, that incredibly self-confident, affluent, greedy New York. 
I thought the novel would be a kind of satirical comedy about that, and then on the day of its publication, it became a historical novel, uh, because that city, in a way, ceased to exist, and another slightly different city replaced it. And nobody did any book tours that year, and a year later, I was asked to do a reading at the 92nd Street Y in New York, and I thought I'd read from it, and I had no idea what the response would be like, because everything was still pretty raw. And I had the strangest experience, and I read this passage, and what I felt coming off the audience was nostalgia. You know, this kind of sense of nostalgia for that other place before the thing. And I remember right that time there was a, a day when, when in the Doonesbury comic strip, which I like, one of the characters said to the other, you know, I really miss September the 10th. <laughs> and, and what happened to that novel was that on the day of its publication, it kind of became September the 10th. It became the novel of the day before. And then the novel I wrote before this, um, Two Years, Eight Months, and 28 Nights, which if you do the math is 1001, um, was a New York novel, but it was a kind of fairy tale of New York. It was a sort of Arabian night story taking place in New York City with, with you know, genies and flying urns, genies riding on flying urns. And, and when I finished it, I thought, you know, I think I've taken this kind of writing as far as it can go and as far as I want to take it anyway. And I think there's not much more for me to do down this particular road. Um, so I thought, do something else, do, do something opposite. And, and so this novel is this, in a way that, the, in part, the answer to that instruction to myself, um, which is, you know, hold the flying carpets, never mind about the magic noses, you know, 86 the genies. And, and to write a novel which was a different sort of a novel about New York, which is in many ways a kind of social panoramic novel. A novel in, to prepare for which I read books that I'm not often associated with, books like, with, but books which had tried to do what I was gonna try and do, which is to capture a moment of the history of, of the city and the country, um, like Edith Wharton's Age of Innocence, like James Baldwin's Another Country, um, novels like that. Um, I also, this is a novel about a evil old patriarch with three messed up sons. And, and there is a very famous novel about an evil old patriarch with three messed up sons. It's called The Brothers Karamazov. <laughs> and, and, and so I thought I better you know, pay my respects to Dostoevsky by checking him out. And, and actually, tell you the truth, he wasn't much use. Um, because, the, because Dostoevsky, he, he, what he's doing as a writer is so unlike what I was trying to do that, that that apart from that echo in the shape of the book, there wasn't, there wasn't much that I gained from it. I mean, the writer that I did get a lot from, which I always get a lot from, is Charles Dickens. Um, because one of the things that I've always admired about Dickens and, and particularly tried to use in this book is, is the contrast between the background and the foreground in his books. So the, the, in the Dickensian background, the world of Charles Dickens, the, the city, of the Dickensian city, you know, is, is portrayed with minute, scrupulous, obsessive real, realism, you know, incredible social detail um, and naturalistic accuracy. Um, and so the world of the, the, that world, you know, the Dickensian city lives in our imagination even today because it's created with such incredible attention to to minute detail. And a thing that I've always admired about him is that he seems to be able to talk about the whole of society. You know, he's not just talking about his own little patch, you know. He can talk about aristocrats and murderers and debtors and swindlers and petty shopkeepers and, you know, anything that's happening in, in, in England in his time, he seems able to capture and put on the page. And that breadth of vision, uh, you know, I've tried to, to emulate it in, in various books and certainly in this one. Um, get out of your comfort zone. I think there's actually something very important about writing, which is that there's a way in which the novel is like journalism. The novel is about reporting on the society. You know, um, uh, Stondhal once described the novel as a mirror walking down a road. 
And, and I think you do have to do that. You've got to go find out the story. You can't just assume you know everything. So, for example, in this novel, the Nero Golden, this evil old patriarch, is, has been very involved with, uh, with organized crime back in his original home country of Bombay, uh, India, Bombay, the city of Bombay, Nero Golden, not his real name. But by the way, a man who calls himself Nero Golden is already telling you something about what he thinks about himself. <laughs> this is not a modest man. <laughs> um, anyway, he has this, this evil past, and in order to create him, I had to find out a lot about the Bombay criminal mafias, which was actually extremely enjoyable. Uh, I, I began to feel like Mario Puzo, <laughs> you know, translated into Hindi. Um, <laughs> uh, and then he, when he's in New York, he has these three sons who have d different agonies, and, and one of them is, is brilliant but high-functioning autistic. One of them is very conflicted about uh, gender transition or whether to do that or not. And one is just very nostalgic for home and doesn't like really the way in which he's been obliged to relocate. And there, and that meant I mean, I, do, I did start off with some knowledge of, I have some friends who are autistic, I have a couple of friends who have been involved in gender transitioning, so I had some like, personal experience as a, kind of, as a way of opening the door, but then I had to go find out a whole lot more. And, and I, think it's, it's, I think it's great when you come out of a novel at the end of a novel feeling better informed than you were when you began writing it. And I hope that's also true about the reader, that the, that the reader at the end of the novel feels a bit better informed than they were at the beginning. It used to be always said that the function, of, one of the functions of the novel was to bring the news. And, and now, theoretically, that's not true because there are so many other ways of getting information. But it seems to me that the more ways there are of getting information, the less information we have, you know, and... and you know, this is, I'm not even talking about the 45th president yet. Uh, <laughs> um, but, um, but, you know, the internet is a place where, where garbage and truth coexists and seems to have more or less the same level of authority. Um, and, and so it's actually, I think, very difficult for many of us to, to distinguish between um, those things. And I think one of the great beauties of the act of writing and reading novels in a time like this, in a time when, when reality and truth uh, have become such disputed territory, is that one of the things that the novel has always been good at doing is in a way making a contract between the writer and the reader. As you read the book, you begin to form a joint agreement about the nature of reality. You know, you, if you like the book, you say to yourself, yes, this is how it is. You know, this is what we are like. This is how things are. And, and it's pleasing to the reader to be able to make that agreement about the nature of the real. And I think, you know, we live in an age in which we really need to start making that agreement again. Uh, we need to find ways, and reading books, reading good books is one such way, um, of getting a grip once again on what reality is, and or therefore, by the way, what it isn't. Um, so I, this is in some sense a private novel. It's a novel about this family with its traumas and, and, and difficulties. But of course, it takes place in New York City at this very moment. It does something which you're taught not to do, which is to write, to write a novel about the exact moment in which the novel is taking place. Um, you're told that you should have distance and perspective and all that, which, yes, you should. Um, but I've not ever been very good at doing what I'm told to do. Um, and, and, <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, and as I say, there are some of the very greatest novels which have tried to do this thing of capturing the moment in which the book is made. I mean, The Great Gatsby, The Bonfire of the Vanities. There's a whole, there's a whole string of these books. Um, and I was rather proud to see that this book got compared to all of those. And I thought, if it's been compared to The Great Gatsby and The Bonfire of the Vanities and The Godfather, what book is that? <laughs> <laughs> what book could that possibly be? Well, apparently I've written it. So, <laughs> um, so that was kind of enjoyable to think. 
But I did clearly, you know, if you're trying to get to grips with, with how things are, um, it, it's, it's, a, it's a difficult moment, I think, and it's a dark moment for somebody of my persuasion. And so I came to think that the book was this, this family tragedy, or, well, I mean, it has comic aspects, so maybe a tragic comedy, a family tragic comedy, but surrounded by the larger tragic comedy of America. And um, the words Donald Trump don't occur in the novel because I wasn't going to let him in. <laughs> um, but but, but the, there is, at the background of the novel, at one point, there is a, the, the, the question of the, the 2016 election is there. And it occurred to me that in, in a deck of playing cards, there are only two cards that don't behave properly, and one of them is the Trump, and the other is the Joker. <laughs> and I thought, well, I don't want the Trump, so I'll have the other one. So there is a character called the Joker, with green hair, um, who runs for president and wins. Um, Batman nowhere to be seen, not in Age of Heroes. Um, so there's that, so there's the context to the novel, it's not only political context, so I think if you're trying to write this kind of grabbing the, what used to be called the zeitgeist, um, you, you have to try and grab everything, whether it's people's obsession with cronuts, you know, or Occupy Wall Street, or whatever, you know, you have to try and let the book be elastic enough to let in what's going on at the time that, uh, of its writing. So that was quite enjoyable to do. So, so yeah, it's, it's a story within a story. It's this, the story of this family, broken family, inside the story of a broken country. You know? and, and I think that's really the thing I wanted to emphasize because actually, if the election had gone the other way, I wouldn't have had to change hardly anything because because it seems to me that, in many ways, that Trump is an effect, not a cause, um, and that the, the rift in America would have been there if, if Hillary had won. Uh, if Trump were somehow to dematerialize tomorrow, it will still be there. Um, and so, the, Rene, the young filmmaker who is the narrator of the novel, who investigates this, this, this mysterious family, He's also very anguished about his country, and that's what he's anguished about. He's anguished not so much about a particular candidate, but about this, this incredibly divided reality in which people can't agree even on a simple thing like what is the case. Um, and that was the book that I wanted to, to write, this book about a private fracturing set inside a public fracturing, and, and then to make it funny. And, I don't know, I think I've got time. I'm gonna read you just a little bit because one of the most unexpected things about this book was a character that I had thought of as being a minor character. There's a certain point when Nero Golden comes to Miami. <laughs> um, and he meets um, somebody, that's, that there are no people like this in Miami. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, an extremely beautiful, very ambitious, gold-digging Russian girl. <laughs> As you can see, completely fictitious. <laughs> and and, um, and she, she gets her hooks into him. And I just thought I'd read you a little bit about how she does that. But the most puzzling thing or surprising thing about this book is ever since it's come out and people have been reading it, people really like her. And people keep saying to me, you know, that Russian girl, she's kind of cool. And I say, you know, she's the most self-seeking, selfish, amoral character in the book. They say, yeah, but she kind of, you kind of dig her. You know? <laughs> and, and so this is really a surprise to the author. You know, that, uh, so I'm just going to read you a little bit about her. You can decide what, what you think. Um, um, I've got about 10 minutes and then we'll have some questions. I'll just read you a few little passages. Here is... Vasilisa, the Russian girl. She is striking. One might say she is astonishing. She has long, dark hair. Her body is also long and exceptional. She runs marathons and is a fine gymnast specializing in the ribbon element of rhythmic gymnastics. She says that in her youth, she came close to the Russian Olympics team. She is 28 years old. Her youth was when she was 15. 
Vasilisa Arsenieva is her full name. Her region of origin is Siberia, and she claims descent from the great explorer Vladimir Arseniev himself, who wrote many books about the region, including the one that became a Kurosawa film, Der Suizala. But this line of descent is not confirmed because Vasilisa, as we will see, is a brilliant liar, uh, accomplished in the arts of deceit. Um, she decides she wants to come to America. She wants to go to America and be adored and send US dollars back to her family at home. This is what she has done. She has flown the coop. Here she is in America, in New York City, and now in Florida. And she is much admired and making money doing the work the beautiful do. Many men desire her, but she is not looking for a mere man. She wants a protector, a czar. Here is Vasilisa. She owns a magic doll. When as a child, an earlier Vasilisa was sent by her wicked stepmother to the home of Baba Yaga the witch, who ate children, who lived in the heart of the heart of the forest, it was the magic doll who helped her escape so that she could begin her search for her czar. So the story goes. But there are those who tell it differently, saying that Baba Yaga did eat Vasilisa, gobbled her up the way she gobbled up everyone. And when she did, the ugly old witch acquired all the young girl's beauty, that she became outwardly the spitting image of Vasilisa the Fair, though she remained sharp-toothed Baba Yaga on the inside. This is Vasilisa in Miami. She is blonde now. She is about to meet her czar. She's on Fisher Island. <laughs> Uh, I mean, where else would she be? Uh, the, the Vanderbilt House is the heart of the island. Rewind, here is William, William Kisson Vanderbilt II on his 250-foot yacht, making a swap deal with the developer Carl Fisher. The yacht, in exchange for the island, shake hands on that. Here is B.B. Rebozo, accused at the time of Watergate of being Nixon's bagman, joining a group that bought the island from the guy who bought the island from the guy who bought the island from Vanderbilt. The island has a history. It has an observatory. It has, as previously stated, peacocks. It has discretion. It has golf. It has class. And this cold holiday season at the Vanderbilt House after the New Year's Eve dance on the fine parquet outdoor dance floor laid down amid trees festooned with strings of light and burning braziers and live music and women in their jewels and security guards guarding the jewels and the men who bought the jewels admiring their property. The island also has a much talked about winter and spring, November and April love affair. My money for your beauty. Shake hands on that. So. Anyway, so she seduces him, right? Uh, because what chance does he have? Um, and um, so after she seduces him, everything you want, she says, when you want it, it's yours. And on the third night, she discusses business. <laughs> this is not a shock to him. This makes things easier. Business is his comfort zone. She produces a printed card the size of a postcard, with boxes to tick. Let's go through the details, she says. Obviously, I should not stay in the house on McDougal Street. That is your family home for yourself and your sons, and I am not your wife, so I am not your family. So you can choose, A, a residence in the West Village for convenience, for ease of access, or B, on the Upper East Side for a little distance, a little more discretion. Very well, B, this is also my preference. So, the size of the apartment, two bedrooms minimum, no? And maybe one more as art studio space, good. And will I own it, or is it a rental? And if so, for how many years? Okay, think about it. We proceed to the car. And this, I leave to you completely. A, Mercedes convertible, B, BMW 6 Series, C, Lexus SUV. Oh, A, so nice, I love you. The question arises of where I will have accounts. A, Bergdorf, B, Barneys, C, both of the above. <laughs> Fendi, Gucci, Prada, this goes without saying. Equinox, Soho House, Every House, you see the checklist. The subject of a monthly allowance. I must comport myself in a manner that befits you. 
You see the categories, 10, 15, 20. I recommend generosity. <laughs> yes, in thousands of dollars, darling. Perfect. You will not regret it. I will be perfect for you. I speak English, French, German, Italian, Japanese, Mandarin, and Russian. I ski, water ski, surf, run, and swim. The flexibility of my gymnastic youth, this I retain. <laughs> In the coming days, I will know better how to satisfy you than you know yourself, and if equipment is needed to assist this, if a room must be constructed, a room for us, let us call it a playroom, I will make sure it is done immediately and with the greatest discretion. I will never look at another man. No other man will touch me, nor will I tolerate any inappropriate advances or remarks. You deserve and must have exclusivity, and it is yours, I swear to you. This is all for now, but there is one more matter for later. This is the matter of marriage, she says, lowering her voice to its huskiest and most alluring level. As your wife, I will have honor and standing. Only as your wife will I truly and fully have this. Until then, yes, I am happy. I am the happiest and most loyal of women, but my honor is important to me. You understand. Of course, you are the most understanding man I have ever met. <laughs> so. so, yeah, my unexpectedly popular villain. <laughs> Just goes to show that sometimes people like bad girls better than good girls. <laughs> anyway, so there it is. It's this novel about New York and America now, with at the heart of it a mystery from across the world. And it's very interesting. It's the first time, really, I've written a book which contains, which, which could be described as, as, as something like a mystery because there's this dark secret. This family has arrived going to enormous lengths to change their identity, to conceal their past, etc. Why? And when, of course, to write such a book, I have to know the answer to why, and then, in a way, you have to construct the book backwards. You have to decide exactly when to drip little bits of information into the reader's ears. And sometimes it's disinformation. You know, there's, there's uh, deliberate misdirection you know, look over there, where everything's happening over here. The president is good at this. Uh, <laughs> um, but it was fun to write a mystery. And, and one of the, the non-writers who really helped me to do it, and this is the last thing I'll say before questions, is Alfred Hitchcock. Uh, I mean, there, strangely, the place in, in Greenwich Village where the novel is set I discovered was about a hundred yards away from what Hitchcock has in, had in mind when he made Rear Window. Uh, and, uh, and it has a kind of Rear Window feeling. It, it, the, the, the central setting is this uh, private communal garden in the heart of the village, which act actually exists, where the characters can enact their stories while being watched by everybody living all around them. Um, and Hitchcock, of course, is the great master of suspense and misdirection and um, so on. And so it's a little bit Hitchcocky in this book. And eventually you find out what the secret is, and I hope you like it. <laughs> um, thank you. So, okay, so we've got 10 or 12 minutes for questions. So if you have some, the mic's over there, standing up in the middle of the, the, the aisle here. Please go to it, and I will try and answer. Yeah. Yes, I wanted to know if uh, Balzac or uh, Cortázar in the book of Manuel had anything to do with the influence that you were talking about, because you didn't mention those two. You're asking about Julio Cortázar? And, and Balzac. Ah. And, and who, sorry? Balzac. Oh, Balzac. Yes, I mean... In terms of, in terms of uh, those are, writing about the, the yes, present yes. moment. I mean, you, you couldn't have named two more different writers in terms of their technique, but... Uh, I mean, I'm a great admirer of, of Cortázar. You know, I, I think his novel Rayuela, Hopscotch, is one of the great novels. Yes, but that too. Yeah, but, but, you know, Cortázar, yes, very cool. Um, Balzac, I felt, was... Balzac, Stondhal, that kind of 
French realist tradition, I think had a little bit more to do with this book uh, than, than Cortazar because the book isn't quite, isn't quite as, well, it's not magic realist for a start, you know, really. Um, um, but I do, I mean, there's, for example, there's a wonderful moment in Balzac's novel, Eugénie Condé, the very beginning of the novel, where, which is almost like a cinematic zoom, where it starts off, he says, this is the city of Marseille, you know, baking in the sun, describes it. Then he says, in this city, there's this particular neighborhood, and this neighborhood is, is like this, it has this kind of people living in it, and so on and so on. In this neighborhood, here's this house, and this is what the house is like, and it, the house is obviously occupied by people of certain kind of wealth and elegance, etc. In that house, here's this room. Look what the room looks like. In the middle of the room, there's a chair, and on that chair, there's this woman. And her name is Eugenie Condé. And by the time you get to her, you already know so much about her because of the way in which the book contextualizes her. Um, I thought it was just a brilliant device, you know, and when you come across a brilliant device, the best thing you can do is steal it. <laughs> so, so, uh, I remember this once. William Faulkner was once accused of plagiarizing the, the technique of multiple narrators that he used in As I Lay Dying. Uh, and he gave this wonderful answer, which maybe only Faulkner could have given, where he said, when I am in the throes of my genius, <laughs> he said, I take whatever I need from wherever I can find it. Um, and I don't know any writer who would do differently. But, I mean, he's right about the second part. I don't think many writers would refer to the throes of their genius. That's all. I think you have to be Faulkner to do that. Anyway, yes, sir. Well, I don't have a prolific question like that one, but I did see you on Curb Your Enthusiasm. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I'd like to know, A, what it was like to work with Larry David. And since the show is totally improvised, did you come up with... Fatwa boys and fatwa sex. <laughs> well, it's, um, it is all improv. Uh, I mean, look, it was fun. I mean, I, I met him a couple of times, just casually, and then he got in touch with me out of the blue and said um, that he'd written this thing and do I want to be in it. And I said, well, what thing is that? Uh, <laughs> and could I, see a, uh, could I see a script? And he said, well, that's difficult because there's no script. <laughs> uh, and... And I said, well, can you tell me something about it? He told me about two or three sentences. And I thought, okay, that sounds funny, I'll do it. And then I arrived and there was a moment of thinking, how would it be if I'm the only person in Curb Your Enthusiasm who's no good? <laughs> you know? so, when you're surrounded by these brilliant comedians, you know, who are, who are so good at improv. And they're very good at making you feel comfortable, I have to say. And, and it's not just improv, it's guided improv. You know? So they, so you know in a given scene, you know that you're supposed to get from here to there. You know what's supposed to happen in the scene. Um, but how you do it is up to you. There are certain lines that I am proud of. I think uh, the, just comparing the fatwa to sexy pixie dust. <laughs> <laughs> that's my line. <laughs> and and there's, a, there's actually a bit that's cut out, which... If you go to the Curb Your Enthusiasm face Facebook page, they have deleted scenes. And, and there's a deleted scene, I mean, I can see why they cut it, but it was fun, <laughs> which is in between the two scenes that I was in. One is, the first scene, you know, is when he comes to visit me in my house, this unbelievable mansion with servants and so on. Uh, and then we go to this restaurant. Well, there was a scene when we we're leaving the house to go to the restaurant. And as we're walking out, he says to me something like, uh, so, are there female butlers? And I say, yeah, I mean, I, yes, I think there are. There's a few, there's some female butlers, yes. And he says, because that would be better, like a female butler, because there'd always be the possibility of sex. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I say, no, 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 Larry, that's, that's, you don't understand. There, there's a rule in the butlering world. And, and he says, what's, what's the rule? And I said, the rule is don't fuck the butler. <laughs> <laughs> And that was my line. <laughs> so, so, that's my line. Anyway, you know, all I could say is it was, it was two, two of the most enjoyable days I've had for a long time. Thank, Thank you. Hi. Speaking of fatwa, um, I was a 60 year old in Tehran when I heard Ayatollah Khomeini's fatwa against him being read on 
the national TV. And my mom told me, see, this is why you shouldn't criticize Islam. So fast forward 28 years, I'm an ex-Muslim now. I'm still being told by Americans and Canadians that I shouldn't criticize Islam, but this time in the name of diversity. So my question is, how do you see this dynamic between Islamic culture and Western culture play out itself, and what would you suggest to me and other ex-Muslim um, as the best approach to talk to the Westerners and Muslims to make some sort of a balance? It's an honor. Look, thank you I very think, much. Thank you. I think just, just say what you think. There's nothing else. You, know, you can't second-guess people. Um, I mean, if you believe things to be true, you should say them. You know, it, I mean, Islam is not immune to criticism. No, no, I, no set of ideas is just because they pay lip service to a non-existent sky god. I mean, I, I even hear myself the echo of my friend Christopher Hitchens saying that, but um, um, now that Christopher is no longer with us, I think I probably... I'm probably like one notch up in the, in the, in the line of most aggressive atheists. Yeah, we need it. So, so I, don't, you know, I, don't, I don't see any reason t per se to give religious ideas respect. Um, and I just think you have to make a distinction between human beings and ideas. It's perfectly right that people should not be persecuted and they should, you know, that racism should be called out and it does exist, etc. That's, that's fine. But that doesn't mean you have to pussyfoot around ideas if you think they're not right. You know, if you think the world is flat, I have to be allowed to tell you you're an, you're an idiot. Mm. You know? and, and, and then you have to be allowed to tell me why you think it's flat. Mm -hmm. Because it looks flat. <laughs> and then I'll tell you you're an idiot again. Um, <laughs> um, I mean, there has to be free play in the discussion of ideas, and that includes theological ideas. And, and you just have to distinguish between that and attacking human beings. They're different things, people and ideas. And they get blurred in this kind of conversation and they need to be kept apart. How do you see Thanks. this? Thanks. I mean, look, it's a very long subject and yeah. we don't have time, but that's as much as I can do for you right do now. Do you think ever there will be any kind of a balance between Islamic culture and a Western culture? I have no idea, no sign of it yet. Yeah. You know, Thank you very much. Thanks. Hi, Mr. Rushdie. My name is Prashant. Um, I actually need some advice from you. I'm a screenwriter, and um, I was born and raised a Hindu, and I learned about Christianity back in 2006. So I started reading up on it, and I started to question it, and I wrote a comedy screenplay about um, if, if the story was told from a feminist, Mary of Nazareth's point of view, where she's a career-driven person and refuses to calling from God. Um, and I got a lot of pushback once it was finished. People are like, wait a minute, what have you written about? And I'm like, wait a minute, what have I written about? So as someone that's questioned religion and written about it, how did you handle it when the satanic verses came out and the pushback, and how did you overcome that? Yeah, well, I would not recommend it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting the same <laughs> I, mean, I mean, it was... It was, it was, no, I mean, you know, it was very difficult. I mean, a book you might be interested in, given what you've just said, is, is Mikhail Bulgakov's great novel, The Master and Margarita, which, which retells the story of Jesus from the point of view of Pontius Pilate. Um, and it's, it's very, very, I mean, that's only one of the narrative strands in the book, but, but it's a brilliant change of angle of the kind of thing you're talking about. Uh, and... Um, you know, look, if, if you had asked me in 1989, this is what's going to happen to you in the next decade and how do you think you'll be at the end of it, I would probably not have backed myself to be in reasonably good shape. But, but you know, you discover sometimes that you're more resilient than you thought you were. And um, I'm, I'm glad to be at this end of the story because now it's a long time ago. I mean, look, the, sat the Satanic Verses was my fifth published book. Right. Uh, this is my 18th. You know, so... So most of my life as a writer comes after it, and, and um, it feels like a long time ago, you know? And, and uh, I'm proud of it, and I'm really pre pleased that now that the fuss is less, that the book is finally being read just as a novel. You know, it's just being, it's being studied in colleges and so on, and, and then it has the life of a novel. Some people love it, some people hate it, and some people are somewhere in between. 
And that's, that is the ordinary life of a book, you know, and, and it's what it was denied for a very long time. Right. And so I'm glad that it can finally have that life worth fighting for, you know, and there also was this small principle called free expression, uh, which is worth fighting for, particularly in these times when we have an administration which is very keen on the Second Amendment, but not so keen on the first. <laughs> Correct. Right. Right. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. I've only got two minutes, so let me try and answer. Uh, this may require less because you, you touched on it, but um, regarding Christopher Hitchens, have you speculated much about what he might think about this day and age? Who might think? Hitch. Yes. You know, it's very difficult because Christopher hated the Clintons. Christopher's dislike of, of the Clintons was pathological. Yep. You know, um, and... Um, so what would he have done? I don't know, because, I mean, he was far too smart to buy into, you know, Trumplandia. Yeah. Um, but I think he'd have been quite conflicted, well, you know. Um, but, you know, I don't know. We need him, but we don't have him. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Salman Rushdie, for gracing us again at Miami Book Fair. Thank you very much. <laughs>